Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's just uh, do a quick review, and we will continue with what we from what we where we started yesterday. Uh, we looked at uh, the early church, right? Uh, we looked at the first century church. We looked at the happenings of the second century church, uh, uh, and, and we saw a certain. Uh, important events that happened uh, in both the first and the second century church. So uh, just a quick review. Uh, in the first century church, we saw the Council of Jamnia, which was where they acknowledged the Old Testament uh, as the Hebrew uh, scriptures, the canonical scriptures. Uh, then the book of Revelations was written in the first century. And we also saw that Christianity began to spread uh, in different parts of the world, like Sri Lanka, Algeria, Monaco, uh, and all these different places. Uh, the second century, we saw heresies entering the church. We looked at Gnosticism, uh, Marcionism, and uh, Montanism. Uh, and then we looked at also some wonderful things that happened where, uh, uh, you know, there were apologists that were rising up. Uh, to defend all that was happening within the church, right? Uh, and and we saw that Clement of Alexandria, again a great theologian, was able to do a lot of work, uh, uh, especially in Egypt and uh, different parts of the world. So um, we looked at all these aspects within the first century and the second century church. Now, before we go into the second century, uh, sorry, the third and the fourth century church, uh, let's just say a quick word of prayer and uh, we'll begin so uh, can any one of us just lead us in prayer please go ahead any one of us please. shall i pray first yes go ahead Abhi. we thank you father god almighty for this beautiful morning we thank you for your amazing grace amazing presence amidst us father as we are learning father and whatever we are learning, Father, open our hearts, open our minds to receive it in its fullness, Father. Be guided by your truth, Father. And everything that we learn, be blessed, Father. Bless our teachers, anoint their heads, Father. And give us that wisdom to understand things, Father, in the right perspective. Lead each of us in your paths of righteousness, Father. Continue to be with us throughout the day, Father. And in everything what we learn, Father, may we be guided by your Holy Spirit. We give you all control. And we thank you for this time. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray and ask. Amen. 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 Thank you, Avni. Okay. Uh, so let's pick up from the third century church. So we're going to look at uh, year 200, 8200 to 8300, right? Uh, like we uh, mentioned over uh, the previous weeks, there's going to be a lot of dates, a lot of people involved. Uh, but what we want to catch and remember are certain important events that happen. Now, you know, some of some of us may think, okay, why, uh, why do I need to learn all this? Uh, you know, if I know the Old Testament, know the New Testament, that's uh, more than enough. Yes, that's true. But when we study Christian history, uh, it gives us a better foundation to understand the difficulties, the challenges that people faced, and how. You know, you and I are just so privileged to just take a Bible, open it up, begin to read it. Uh, uh, but it was not so, uh, you know, in the early church. So uh, studying this will help us put things into context. Even, you know, we one of the things that has really helped me it is it helps me to value the things that, uh, you know, we have. You know, even the fact that we have different versions of one Bible is, is so amazing and uh, and the opportunities that we have online. So all these things, uh, you know, if we look at it, we begin to value it even more as we study this. So don't uh, worry, as I said, don't worry about the dates. How am I going to remember all of this? But what you can do is uh, probably make certain points of, uh, you know, important events that happen. So that way you can remember it as well. Okay, let's look at uh, the third century church, right? We did start a little bit of it yesterday, but let's uh, uh, pick up from here. Now, a new emperor, Emperor uh, Severus, forbids 
conversion to Christianity, right? But even though there's this new emperor who says that Christianity is spreading and two great Christian apologists or we would say Christian lawyers, they were, uh, and you will hear of them, uh, uh, you know, if, if anyone studying church history will know them. Their, their names are Tertullian and Origen. They were very, very uh, impactful in the books that they wrote. Uh, Tertullian was a Christian lawyer who wrote many articles, uh, uh, mostly to the uh, Christians and the people in North Africa. Uh, and he wrote books, he wrote tracts. And in his writings, he basically focused on the Trinity, uh, saying that, okay, uh, this is what the Trinity is. And he's the first one to use the term Trinity. So the word Trinity came about almost, you know, 200 odd years after the birth, uh, uh, after the death of Jesus Christ, after the Pentecost as well. So uh, then there's Origen, who was another Christian apologist, and he began to give, you know, uh, remember we spoke about in the second century church, Gnosticism and all these heresies that came into the church. So Origen took a, Took, a, took up upon himself to write articles defending those uh, or writing against them. Okay, these are heresies. These are things that are against the church. So we need to stay away from it. So uh, both Tertullian and Origen's writing was vastly used um, among the churches all across the world. So they really became famous. Um, again, they, they were also captured later on. Uh, and they were also put to death. But uh, now when we look at it, we, we may wonder why is it that they're, you know, they're in different parts of the countries. Why is it that they're getting captured and, you know, uh, being sent to Rome and being killed? Is because remember that Roman was a, Rome was a central power right, during that time. And so, uh, and they wanted prominence, uh, world prominence, we would say. So uh, what they would do is, if, if even if there's somebody in Africa and ministry or some leaders growing there, uh, you know they would try to do, you know, place some false allegations, bring them to Rome, and finally, you know, uh, get them uh, killed. And so it was like a practice that they followed. So it was uh, it was not something which they struggled to do. But what the Romans could not do was stop. Uh, the spread of Christianity. All they were doing was they would, you know, martyr all these great leaders, great apologists, writers. But the work of the ministry was continuing. Right? They could not stop it. So after that, an emperor named Decius comes. Now, he made life difficult for the Christians. He said, okay, everyone must offer pagan sacrifice, meaning you have to uh, worship the idols of Rome. Uh, 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 and then you have to show a certificate of proof that, you know, I, okay, I worship this God, uh, 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 an idol. And, and the church went through a really difficult time uh, uh, through Emperor Decius. Uh, uh, they went through persecution. Uh, the church was attacked from every side. Uh, yet uh, the ministry did not stop. Right? There was a uh, AD 300, a great man named Anthony the Great. Uh, uh, now, here comes in a new kind of, uh, you know, leading where the Holy Spirit leads Christians into a different kind of a leading where um, Anthony the Great, uh, you know, he, he goes into, um, you know, the deserts and he, he sits by himself. He basically, he goes into this whole thing of, uh, you know, uh, secluding himself from the, uh, you know, from people and spending time on the scriptures and all of it. So he started something like, uh, you know, the uh, monasticism, right? Uh, monastic kind of a uh, learning in Christianity. Now he he was considered as the founder of that. So he felt that okay, uh, monastic study is very important. Where they go away from the city, go into secluded places, pray read the word, seek the Lord, um, and, you know, really build on yourself. So he, Anthony the Great, was the one who founded it. And after him, there were many who followed it. Many took up this, um, you know, monastic kind of uh, life. Now, 
you know some of us may think okay this uh, you know monastic kind of life is only for buddhism for jainism and uh, all these other religions no it was actually started off uh, uh, here uh, uh, it was started off through this and uh, and we see that because of this move uh, the fear of the lord became even more people were deeply rooted in god's word uh, people were deeply rooted in you know uh, prayer and uh, we could see the spiritual life of uh, believers increasing so many people took up monastic they would go uh, spend time maybe a couple of months years spend time reading the word praying and then they would come back and minister in power so uh, because of this monastic life uh, 8300 north africa becomes the center of uh, christianity uh, so by the end of this third century uh, there had about a million christians uh, in you know all of uh, in the whole of north africa and we see that the church began to grow imagine a million christians right uh, uh, and I, i would say it was because of this monastic uh, you know uh, work that was started by anthony the great and so is actually his name is anthony but they this added the great because uh, because what he did really impacted the christian community right so north africa becomes the key center for christianity now what do the romans do they can't go to africa and try to you know kill all the people or uh, try to wipe out christianity it's not going to happen all they can do is maybe catch some of the leaders or by this time there were bishops and deacons try to catch them and uh, you know uh, put them to task that's all they could do uh, because it was out of their reach no more is uh, you know christianity a small religion it is just spreading like fire the more the persecution the more the church is growing so we enter the fourth century church now if we have maybe studied church history before or uh, you know looked at documentaries we all know that the fourth century church was one of the most difficult years uh, for christian history for the church community there was an emperor named emperor diocletian now he went full throttle persecuting the church right his main aim was to wipe out christianity right uh, so he's uh, here you know uh, so there's emperor nero who brought persecution in the first century he was almost in line with nero right? emperor diocletian so he did all he could to wipe out christianity so during this time uh, a, a new group called the uh, donatists came out now who are they they are believers right now when emperor diocletian came there was persecution so what happened was some of them denied the faith they said okay we don't want to be martyred we don't want to be killed um, we don't want to go through all of this persecution okay we deny this we will do what you ask us to do right uh, and they went away from uh, you know christianity and all of that but after some time they came back after the persecution ended they came back to christianity now after coming back to christianity what happened is this uh, person named bishop uh, donatus he said you people have you know rejected the faith and now uh, during persecution and when times are fine you'll have come back and uh, trying to be leaders uh, in the church and that's not right so bishop donat uh, donatus he went away from the church uh, because of all this you know uh, he felt that they were uh, you know they were being uh, uh, they were not being true to the gospel they were when persecution came they just uh, ran away uh, but now when things are right they're coming so what happened was this whole church now this happened again uh, in north africa right end of the third century there are about a million people in christians in the church beginning of the fourth century there's a division in the church right what happens the strongest center of christianity is disrupted right now 
many of them lose interest in Christianity. Many of them turn away from Christianity. Many of them, uh, you know, now there's a division. There's the Donatists, and then there are people who are in the church, right? Uh, so what happens here? The whole strength of the church is weakened. Right? They were a strong community by the end of the sec uh, third century, fourth century. In the beginning, there was a problem, this division, and there's weakness in the church. Now, what is one important lesson that you and I can learn through this? Right. Uh, see, these people were filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. The move of God is working. There's a revival. There's an outpouring. Thousands of people are accepting the Lord. Um, persecution is still there, but they are strong. They are courageous. But what is it that you and I can learn? You know, as I was you know, studying these things and, uh, you know, doing research on uh, Donatists and all these other wonderful ministries that were happening during that time, one thing that was highlighted was there was lack of forgiveness. There was lack of humility during that time. Now, I'm not saying all of them, right? Uh, but just picture this. Uh, so even I was uh, studying this, I was just thinking, okay, what if this Bishop Donatus said, okay, we forgive you, let's continue uh, and work together to build the church. Everything would have been fine. I, I believe that the church would have just enlarged and expanded and greater things would have happened. But probably now it was 1 million, maybe it would have gone on to 2 million people, 3 million, the church would have just expanded. But because of this, there was division. So an important thing to remember, in the midst of an outpouring, in the midst of a revival, right, where God is moving, it is important to have a personal check on ourselves, right? Because sometimes we may be so focused on ministry, so focused on the things to do. Okay, I need to do this, I need to do that. And um, especially those who are leading in the church, or maybe pastors or um, in some kind of leadership role in the church, we may get so focused, right? Uh, okay, I want to do this, I want to do this in the church. These are the, you know, the to-do list. And so what happens is we forget to keep a check on ourselves. That's very important. Uh, a very important lesson to learn in, uh, from, from the uh, church history is as you're doing, as we're doing the work of the Lord, as God is pouring out his spirit and we're doing the ministry, remember to keep a check on ourselves, right? Whether we are doing things right, whether we are in line with the word of God, uh, that's an important thing that we have to always see because, uh, you know, sometimes we may uh, we may look at ministry as a task, right? Of course, there are a lot of things that we have to do. Uh, but if we do it out of selfishness and out of uh, unforgiveness, out of jealousy, out of pride, uh, it is not going to be a fruitful ministry. Right? So it's very important. Uh, you know, some of us may be busy all throughout the week uh, in ministry uh, or, or in anything that we're doing. Always remember to go back, spend your personal time reading the Word of God. Spend personal time in prayer. Right? That is what uh, will help us to keep a check on ourselves right? as we continue with ministry. Okay, so... AD 312, now some of us may have heard of this emperor, Constantine the Great. Now, this man, uh, you know, he was uh, uh, on his way to a fight. And then during that, just before that, he had a vision of a cross. Uh, and uh, in that vision the, on the cross, it, it was, this, uh, was, uh, was the writing, in this sign, you conquer. Right, written under it. So he went for the uh, war and Emperor uh, Constantine won the battle. Now, after winning the battle, he said, it is because of the God of the Christians that I won this battle. So he did a wonderful thing. Emperor Constantine said, we will make Christianity. We will support Christianity. We will try and legalize it 
in our uh, in the nation and in the different nations so uh, he went on to legalize christianity in rome so it was legal right he gave them so much of freedom that christians could you know it it was legal to become a christian and uh, yeah, constantine also helped rebuild the temple uh, of jerusalem that was destroyed uh, during the second century and so millions of people millions of people were added into the church there was no risk there was no persecution uh, the you know people uh, got many opportunities uh, but because there was no persecution because there was no uh, you know uh, you know getting becoming a christian was just so easy a uh, laxity began to you know creep into the church right which means their belief system their character their behaviors began to come down but the church got big lands emperor constantine uh, you know if we look at church history it says that he donated huge uh, pieces of land to christians uh, uh, where they could sit and pray and uh, uh, there are also reports that you know he he paid pe people to write scriptures and uh, to teach the scriptures in different places so the church was getting good buildings good structures good uh, um, uh, opportunities political opportunities social opportunities but with all of this came black city uh, the 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 want of one you know the desire to know more of god just went down uh and you know when we read about this we most of them say it's because of the luxuries of rome and it's because of you know there was no persecution life was all right everything was fine uh people forgot uh, about you know the challenges of being a christian and uh, what happened during this time the word teaching of the word the working of the holy spirit uh, you know ministry of the word healings miracles the church as a whole became completely dampened right? it became a form of religion before it was like oh, uh, we're being persecuted, but still the work has to go on. So there was this urgency. There was this need to spread the gospel. Uh, the outpouring was fresh. But now what's happened is it's it's all become, you know, okay, we get up, let's go to church. If you want to go, go. Uh, if you don't want to go, don't go. Uh, you know, that kind of an attitude. And uh, pagan styles of worship, uh, you know, uh, it is said that uh, uh, Constantine, being a Roman, uh, he there's no account of him accepting Jesus, uh, but what he did was he tried to bring in uh, aspects of the Roman uh, worship into Christianity, and pagan styles of worship uh, began to enter the church, uh, and it it was all uh, very you know it was very slowly entering the church, causing a big 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 damage to the church. So now. What happens? The Lord raises up a few leaders. Bishop Eusebius was uh, uh, a bishop in Caesarea. Now, what he does is he begins to write. He says, okay, he writes many, many, many books and articles to the church saying, this is not what we are. We are a church that is empowered to touch lives, to minister to people. And uh, this is what the early church went through. So he, in many of his writings, he wrote about the early church, saying these are the challenges and uh, these are the people who gave their lives for the gospel and now we are not taking it forward. We need to do something about it. Uh, so many articles were written about it. Uh, and later on, there, here's an important thing that happened, 8325, the Council of Nicaea. Uh, here in the Council of Nicaea, uh, basically, uh, uh, I, I think some of us may ha have heard of the Nicene Creed. Uh, and in this council, what happens is, uh, you know, uh, Constantine himself sat as a, a moderator and he said, okay, the Christians have to 
recite this Nicene Creed. Uh, and the Nicene Creed was based on uh, Christian rule, uh, Christian faith and all of that. So, uh, so what's happening? There's some kind of hierarchy. But after the Council of Nicaea, we see that, you know, it was more of a form of religion. Right. And this was the time when Roman Catholic, Catholic uh, system came into place. The Romans were OK with Christians uh, being around. But the Roman uh, culture, the Roman, uh, you know, pagan styles of worship entered the church. And then it all became, you know, creeds, reciting stuff reciting a few verses or reciting uh, and and it all became a form of religion we see here during this period it was a complete drop the outpouring of the holy spirit was dampened now whose work was that was it god who stopped it or was it the people that caused it it was it was the people people yes it was the people because if if not for this if if even though uh, you know constantine said okay you know christians you, you can go ahead and you know we'll build your buildings and uh, there's no persecution what we should have done was focused on maybe raised up teams to focus on ministry of the word and so that's what they did in the early church Focus, raise up teams, focus on sharing the word, worship, uh, uh, teaching, preaching of the word, ministry of the word and all of it. And then you would have another team looking after the social, political and all these other aspects, church buildings and all of it. But what happened was the entire attention went into all of this. Oh, no persecution. Let's build churches. Let's come up with new things in the church. And uh, and Constantine was like, OK, you do what you want to do. No problem. You want to add anything in. You want to remove something. You can remove. You want to add something to the church. You can do what you want. There was lack of wisdom during that time. Lack of good leaders. A very important lesson to learn from church history, right? That uh, you know, this Council of Nicaea, it not only caused a lot of problem later on, it, it, it was a step into Roman Catholicism. Uh, and, and there were bishops in Rome, in Antioch, in different places. They were given authority over large provinces. So what uh, in the Council of Nicaea, what Constantine said is, OK, let's raise up leaders, bishops, and uh, uh, you know some kind of leaders, Roman leaders also. right? So the bishops and a Roman leader would you know, work together in this particular province. So you have Alexandria, Rome, Antioch, uh, and they would lead the church. Now picture this. You have a Roman who is not a believer, right? And you have a bishop who is a believer, but he's more interested in social and political and all these other aspects. How do I make more money? Those kind of attitudes. So these two have formed a team, and they've been given large provinces. Right. And what happens? The Roman influence comes into the church. The bishops are so easily, hey, why don't we, you know, well, well, let's do this. Let's put a, um, you know, a little idol and say, if you pray to this, you know, we can get some offerings. So now the bishop is not strong in the word. What's happening? You say, OK, let's do it. Let's put a small idol. Nothing wrong with it. We'll make an idol of Jesus and put it there. And we'll say, OK, those who want to uh, put offerings, put it there. And so what happens? It's an entry into idol worship. So what happened during this time is the Roman Catholic Church began to rise. Roman governance with Christian believers together forming the Roman Catholic Church. And since the Roman Catholic Church started, uh, uh, several others have been added. Uh, and then the church uh, in AD 330, the church moves for its center from Rome to Constantinople. And we see that uh, you know uh, Roman Catholicism begins to take power. Yet not all is uh, ended, right? Uh, things get there are people, the Lord raises up people, 
right uh, a name a man named uh, 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 jerome uh, i think some of us may have heard him he he was uh, commissioned by god to uh, you know uh, translate the bible so he what he did is he translate the bible into latin and what he also did was he wrote against what is happening in the church right he wrote that you know what we are doing in the church is wrong uh, we need to know uh, how to you know we need to look at the old early church and take examples from them but by then um, the you know the whole church the whole structure of the church has uh, got roman influence right uh, and then uh the old testament scriptures many people god raised up many people to translate scriptures to translate the old testament the new testament and so what uh, jerome did is he translated the bible into latin uh and that version is called the vulgate uh version where he translated the entire bible later on into um latin so so we see here um uh, you know there was a rise and fall in christianity and it's sad to see that you know the leaders did not take responsibility of the outpouring that was going on right the outpouring was still there right if we see the uh, you know in the end of the uh, second missionary uh, sorry second uh, century uh, sorry the third century church we see that a million people came into the church in africa right so that means what the outpouring was still there but there was no one to channelize that outpouring there was no one to uh you know make sure that this outpouring of the holy spirit is uh, you know manifested in the right way or is taken care of in the right way it was like basically saying okay outpouring holy spirit you just stay out of this for some time let's just get our lands get the church done let uh, make some big buildings um and holy spirit you stay out of it for a while it was almost like saying that so then after this whole thing comes what we call as the dark ages of the church the dark ages is simply the time when the church went through its most miserable time there was no outpouring there was no word there was no teaching there was no working of miracles nothing was happening during the dark ages it is a very sad time but let's look into it the new testament uh, uh was translated into many many uh, uh languages right by now almost 20 to 22 different languages the bible has been uh, uh, uh not the bible only the new testament has been uh, uh translated um uh, and and so what is the dark age the church became institutionalized all this while it was just okay it was just a, a a small group of people and then that began to grow and grow and grow different places and all of it uh but now it became an institution what happened popes were put in place and they exercised spiritual power over people right now not only did they not pray for people and uh, look at the development of the church and and uh, uh, you know the spiritual welfare of the believers but what they did is they collected taxes from the christians they raised armies they subjugated kings they were a dominant force throughout the entire western world now the morality and the spiritual condition of the church was almost nothing right liturgies forms rituals replaced scriptures and the teaching of the scriptures right now the laity people who became believers did not have access to the scriptures and we know that uh, what happened in the early church uh, the roman um, you know the pope said we'll have one bible that will be kept in the church you have anything you come you ask the pope the pope will tell you what to do what the pope says is the law and nothing more nothing less you got to believe what he says if he says jesus did not die on the cross you got to believe it and so 
the church went in through some of the most horrendous teachings later on, wrong practices such as prayers to saints, which happens now, uh, belief in purgatory. Uh, uh, purgatory is basically a, a, a place where you know they believe that uh, it is a Roman uh, belief system. It just came into the church as well. Uh, purgatory is a place where you know you after you die, the souls uh, will be you know resting there, a place uh, to rest. And then after they rest there, uh, the prayers of the people of their own family will decide whether they go to heaven or hell. And there's no such place as purgatory. The Bible says that. Paul writes and he says, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So we see these kind of teachings, right? Purgatory, transubstitution. Transubstitution is like basically, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jesus did not die. It was somebody else who came and took his place. Right? Um, and then there was indulgence. There was relic worship. The church was considered an infallible uh, uh, institution. Supreme powers resided on the Pope. Monastic monasticism uh, slowly declined. So there were no people who were going, studying the word and uh, teaching the word. All of that was declined. All the focus was in a church that was institutionalized. right? Uh, and it was a sad story. Imagine you become a believer during that time. Before that, the scriptures were available. But now, uh, with the institutionalized church, there was no Bible. They could not go into the scriptures. They were not allowed to. Uh, and this was such a wrong thing to do because it was just hindering the work of the Holy Spirit. Right Now, we know that the scriptures were powerful. The scriptures are still powerful. Right? The scriptures, the word of God is, is able to touch people's lives. And we see in church history, uh, the early church and over the centuries that it was the word, teaching of the word that touched many lives. Um, uh, you know, Asia, in Asia Minor, in Europe, in Africa, uh, it was the word of God that impacted lives. And now they've taken up that whole thing of saying that, okay, whatever the Pope says is right. And uh, it was, and it was completely a dark time for Christianity. But uh, the Lord still, in, in during this time, raised up leaders who would stand against this uh, whole, uh, you know, institutionalized church. Uh, uh, so there's this great person named Augustine who sends missionaries to. England to reintroduce the gospel. So Augustine was, uh, if we study about Augustine, he was a powerful uh, uh, preacher. And so he goes to England, he reinstitutionalized the gospel. Okay, so by now we should understand that this institutionalized church has formed everywhere. From Rome, it's gone all across. So now the, every place, maybe Africa and, and, uh, England and uh, the West and uh, Egypt, uh, all these different countries, they would have, you know, bought places of land. They would have built high structured churches. All of that would have happened. So Augustine goes, he goes to England. He begins to uh, preach the gospel. He says, okay, it's not about the Pope. It's not about what he's saying. It's about the gospel. This is what Jesus did. This is what Jesus has been doing. This is what it is. And he began to preach the gospel. Many lives were touched. 10,000 people uh, believe in that message and they were baptized. So that was a kind of a, you know, a light in the darkness. Again, God raises up another person named Peter Waldo. And what he, he was a wealthy merchant uh, in Southern France. Now he decided to leave all his comforts and he began to go and preach against the institutionalized church. He says, uh, you know, uh, you people have, uh, you know, some of the things he spoke about, he, he said, let us return to proper 
and pure teaching of the scriptures. He rejected the idea of purgatory and the infallibility of the church. He said Christian lay people should be able to read the word and also preach the gospel. Uh, and, and so since he began to do this, the church, the institutional child, institutionalized church began to persecute him and eventually he was captured and he was martyred. Uh, and so there were people that God raised up and uh, and during this time it was uh, it was during this time that uh, God raised up reformers right and we will what we will do is I don't want to start with reformers uh, because it's a whole new section so uh, we can start from next week but we see that the dark ages had caused the damage to the church but in the midst of it uh, God raises up leaders. Now, if we read the Old Testament, you know, it, and we read church history, especially the second, third, and the fourth century church, we see a resemblance. In the Old Testament, they were, you know, against God. They sinned against God. Right? There was, there was, you know, uh, always something that. The, you know, God had to send prophets to remind them of their calling, remind them of what uh, what their plans and purpose about God. If you read the book of Jeremiah, it's so powerful because he, he writes there, he says, listen, you all are in captivity and it's been almost 40 years now, uh, but I still have plans for you, plans to prosper you, to give you a good hope, a good future. Right? But you need to turn away from these idols. You need to turn away from sin. And remember that I was the one who brought you out of Egypt and a promise, the promised land ahead of you, and all these things. So we see that even during those dark times, God raises up leaders. Uh, even uh, during the Babylonian captivity, God raised up Isaiah. Uh, you know, and Isaiah writes, he says, though darkness covers the earth, thick darkness covers the skies, darkness covers the people, but the Lord will arise upon you. So we see, even in those dark periods, God does not abandon his people. He sends people. In the darkness, he sends, he raises up people, he raises up leaders uh, to bring forth the truth. Many, many emperors, Emperor Nero, Emperor Diocletian, they tried their best to wipe out Christianity. Even now around the world, we see that many of them are trying to wipe out Christianity. It's never going to happen. You, we can never wipe out Christianity. Why? Because it is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's never going to happen. Never will there come a time when there is the, the scriptures won't be there or there will not be preaching. If we, if we look at the old, if we look at revelations, you know, uh, if we do a study on the revelations, the end times, uh, you know, we only look at the other side. Oh, there are sicknesses, there's wars, there's earthquakes, famines, and all of it. But if you look at the other side of the story, there's there's huge, massive. Uh, uh, revival that's happening. Millions of people accept the gospel, right? Uh, so, so we need to look at both sides of the coin, right? And and so it, there's never going to be a time when Christianity will be wiped out. It's never going to happen, right? Uh, and so we can be assured of that, right? Uh, stay to the word, look at the word, learn from the word, build ourselves up. Um, persecutions will come. Challenges will come. Uh, you know, uh, Psalmist says, "Heaven and earth may fail, but His word will remain." Right. So we take courage in all of this. Uh, we got about five minutes left. Anybody would like to share your uh, thoughts? Any questions that you have? Um, uh, I know that. Uh, Pastor Paul, wonderful. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful lecture. Really, it's eye-opening. Because. When you mentioned that there were so many Christians in North Africa, I was just like, wow, does that mean that um, due to the dark age, we lost many of them and then we have Islam, you know, overshadowing most of all the northern countries, you know, it just goes to explain that um, when we, 
when we slack as Christians, we give room for the enemy to to destroy the works of of the church, you know, the works of the Holy Spirit. So that's actually eye opening, and I pray that the reverse can happen. That one day, not not Africa, you know, would be there will be a huge revival, and there will be many people who will come back to Jesus. I hope that can happen. But that that was eye opening. I never knew that actually until you said so. Thank you. Thank you, say yes. <laughs> praise God. Yes, this is what our prayer should be. Uh, like what uh, Say mentioned, it, it was the slackness. Um, and I believe that if if not for that institutionalized church, North Africa could have just, you know, been the center of Christianity. Uh, it was the center of Christianity at that time. It could have just exploded. Uh, again, as Say mentioned, uh, Islam came into being and then other uh, uh, thoughts and ideas came into being. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I believe that if, if the church was not, if the leaders had taken up the right decision saying that, okay, all they had to do was, you know, uh, we can't go back and undo it. But something that we can learn is, you know, all they had to do is just raise up leaders. You teach the word, preach the word, you focus on that. We will focus on the church building and all of this. But they did not do that. And so the entire focus of ministry went into buildings, into money, and into taxes and all these other things. So, yes, so, right. Any other thoughts, any other questions that you may have? No. Oh. I know it's... So from next week, what we will do is we'll get into studying the lives of, uh, yes, anybody? Uh, yes, Kennedy, you'd like to share something? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your teaching. I think, Go ahead. I think I'm more thank you for your teaching. And now more enlightened about the history of the church. But what I wanted to inquire, when was the great Sikhism from the history of the church? Okay, the great Sikhism was, uh, I'm not sure exactly of the year, but what happened was uh, Sikhism is basically an out, out uh, is, is a path from Hinduism. So, uh, so uh, it all came out from there. So uh, Jainism, Buddhism, uh, they were all uh, from the core of Hinduism. So Sikhism, Probably uh, we will. You will learn that in world religions as well. But it probably came out, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, somewhere around the 10th century, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, yes, uh, but you could double check that. Uh, I'm not really sure of the dates. Uh, but somewhere because I know that seventh, uh, eighth century was when Islam, uh, you know, uh, came into being and. Uh, ninth century, it was more of an established. Islam was esta established uh, somewhere, uh, probably about a year or so after that was when uh, you know uh, they're all contemporaries. So uh, maybe about ten or eleventh, uh, but you can double check that. Uh, uh. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts? Any other questions? Uh, uh, if not, we can close. Uh, any any thoughts? Any questions? Okay. All right. So from next week, what we will do is we will look at the lives of leaders. Now it's going to be interesting. We we are done with uh, you know more of okay what happened in the church, but we will look at lives. So we are in this dark ages. God raises up people. So we will look at lives of reformers, right? Uh, those who try to reform. Uh, the church and what are the things that they went through, the challenges, the persecutions, and also uh, many people who lost their lives for the sake of the gospel. So, um, so we can go ahead and next week we will start with that uh, studying the lives of reformers. Right. All right. Shall we close in prayer? Just want to request any one of us to please lead us in prayer. Any one of us close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we bless you, we worship you and adore you. Thank you for this time we have spent, Lord, learning about the history of the church. We thank you, Lord, for our instructor who you have given the wisdom to be able to articulate all this and explain to us. 
We pray, O oh Lord, that as students, Lord, as we're learning all these things, Lord, that you prepare us, Lord, to focus on what matters about the church, about the people, about the word spreading, about the things that matter, Lord, to you, to see that the church grows. And that, Lord, we will not misplace our priorities when it comes to the building of the church, the people. For, Lord, we will be focused on what matters to you and what you desire. Father, we pray that, Lord, your revival will continue and that the fire that was lost, Lord, in places where Christianity was known to be, we pray, Lord, that the fire will return back and many hearts will be returned back to you. We bless you, Father, we pray as we continue, Lord, in this journey. Lord, we pray you expand our minds and, Lord, you would continue to equip us for the walk ahead. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Say. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful week ahead. God bless you all. We'll see you next week.